Today we are joined for a very special episode by a man who does not need any introduction. May you be forewarned that he will make you believe that there are 11 commandments. Just like Cain and Abel and the prodigal daughter, be careful what you wish for. Because common they are, the glory will unveil itself and heads you will win. And even if there is a twist in the tale, the best kept secret will always lead you to not a penny more, nor a penny less. And therein, thereby hangs a tale. The pen is always mightier than the sword, he says. A quiver full of arrows he keeps. He maintains that there is honor amongst thieves, but only time will tell whether this is a false impression or it is something that was always hidden in plain sight. What isn't hidden, however, is his fourth estate. But to cut a long story short, the first amongst equals, amongst all authors worldwide, it is a matter of honor to host the right honorable Lord Archer of Western Supermar, Jeffrey Harvard Archer. Welcome to India's International Movement to Unite Nations author series, sir. And as much as he was smiling right through the conversation, sir, we've prepared some very incisive questions for you. And therefore, I'm pretty sure, just like the English in a couple of test matches, will be playing on the back foot. You're going to be playing on, you'll have to be playing on the back foot on this one. The so questions are not by me, questions are by young people. You're clearly sulking, Rashi. You're clearly frightened to come on with me. No, no, that's, that's, that's not, I, I think it's a four-match test series, so it's too early to call. The Australians were also very happy, sir. In the <laughs> that's, <first> true. <laughs> that's true. And you killed them. That's true. <laughs> but, but, sir, uh, you le led a very distinguished life and, done very, and juggled many roles. But today I want to speak to you about William Warwick. The, and in your own words, you say that it is not a detective story, but the story of a detective. Uh, first, sir, I want to ask you, how did you come about with the concept of William Warwick? Is he the new age Sherlock Holmes for the next generation? Is that the concept with which you wrote William Warwick? Well, I wrote a series, as you know, called The Clifton Chronicles. And the hero in that series uh, was uh, Harry Clifton. And he was a writer. And his, uh, the person he wrote about was William Warwick. And people wrote from me all over the world saying, I want to know more about William Warwick. I knew he was a policeman, so I decided to uh, try and do something that had never been done before because there are so many crime novels. And as you rightly pointed out, Rashid, this is not a detective story, but the story of the life of a detective. Right. So uh, in the first book, he's a constable, nothing ventured. He's a constable learning his trade and he, gets to Scotland Yard to join the fraud squad. In the second book, right. he is transferred to the drugs unit. In the third book, he has to investigate fellow officers. Not easy, not easy. But he goes from constable in the first book to a, to a sergeant, detective sergeant in the second book, and after Detective Sergeant, he becomes Detective Inspector. And in the latest book I'm writing, the one you're referring to, he is a Detective Chief Superintendent, a Chief Inspector, sorry, Detective Chief Super Inspector. Now, my plan, Rashid, was simple. I wanted to take him from his days as a young man, as a police constable on the beat, and in eight books, take him all the way through to commissioner of the Metropolitan Police. So each book would be an individual book with an individual story. It might be art, it might be drugs, it might be murder, it might be investigating his own people, but a different subject every time and a different rank. So each book is an individual book. The only difference is that put together, they take him from constable all the way through to commissioner, as long as I live long enough to do it, Rashid, because I'm 80, <laughs> nearly 81, and I've got four more books to write. Well, but you don't look 81, and I must say that uh, we, we only hope that you live 100 and even more so that you can write. Thank you. Thank you. So does, does, does William Warwick eventually become just like you? Does he become the mayor of London and then join the Conservative Party? No, he is a policeman through his life. In the first book, right. Nothing Ventured, his father is a distinguished QC. Right. Distinguished lawyer and barrister. 
Right. And he wants his son, William, to join him at the bar. Of course. But his son is determined to be a policeman. So he doesn't go to Oxford and read law, which his father wanted him to do. He goes to London University and studies art history. Right. And so he becomes an expert in that field. That's why in the first book, Nothing Ventured, he is transferred to Scotland Yard to study a major case about a missing Rembrandt. But as I said, he will progress up. So in the second book, he's a detective sergeant investigating drugs. Which, which is why I'm asking, saying in the third, fourth, and the fifth book, because the first two books I've read, and they're, of course, bestsellers, but the third, fourth, and the fifth is what I was trying to get at. For all the, all the viewers who are watching and thousands are watching on social media across, which is why I said in the third or the fourth or the fifth book, does he become the mayor of London and does he join politics just like how you no. did? And no. no, he doesn't. So he's, he's a detective right through. Yes, correct. He's a, he's a detective right through. Correct. No, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to catch the headlines so that we could give it to the news agencies to make the headlines tomorrow in India. <laughs> <laughs> and the headline is, if he longs, lives long enough, William Warwick will become commissioner. Will become commissioner. If I live long enough. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure, and we're eagerly looking forward to that. But sir, I might, must ask you, your writing is hugely admired, but you've led a very colorful life. You've juggled so many hats, like I mentioned earlier. Are any of your characters, because going through many of your books, I see so many similarities between your characters and probably incidents in your real life. I mean, of course, it's work of fiction that you mentioned at the end of the day, but are there any similarities between, and are, do, does your real life serve as inspiration to your writing. I'm approached a lot by young people in India who want to write a book. And I always say to them, write about what you know about, and then the reader will feel comfortable. So yes, you're quite right, Rashid, a lot of what happens in my books, I've experienced through business or politics or my love of art, they all get into the books. So a lady came to see me quite recently and said, you know, I want to write a book, Jeffrey, but I, I haven't met all the people you've met. I haven't had the wonderful experiences. And she, I said, what do you do? And she said, I work in a hairdresser shop. And I said, well, frankly, madam, you will get more stories in a hairdresser shop than <laughs> I will ever get in my life. So which is why I always advise people, write about what you know about. Write about what you know about. But sir, uh, uh, that's what I did. You managed to sell 320 million copies of your books. I've managed to sell 32. Now the problem is that- 32 that, books, <laughs> Rashid, or 32 million? No, no, not 32 million. And I, that was, uh, I, I, was, I was simply joking. It's a little more than 32, a little less than 32 million, but it's nowhere close to 320 well, million. Well, well, let me tell you, my well, first book, <laughs> shush and listen, my first <laughs> My first book in hardback sold 3,000 copies. Right. My second book in hardback sold 8,000 copies. My third book, Cain and Abel, sold a million copies in the first week. So you wait for the breakthrough. It doesn't happen immediately. It, it doesn't happen immediately. So it will take time. No. It Not is. unless you're very lucky indeed. It's very rare for a first book to be a success. It can be a success later because if you become successful, people then go back to your earlier books. So Not a Penny More, Not a Penny Less has now sold 27 million copies, but it only sold 3,000 in its first year. No, and, and we look forward to your books here in India. Uh, as much as I'm sure across the world, young people are looking forward to your latest book. But let me ask you this question. When you pin down this series at that juncture, uh, is there a thought process when you, when you form your characters? Is there a way or a style of writing? Because your residence, as it's popularly called, if I'm not wrong, is writer's block. Now, when, when people face difficulty in terms of stitching together a story, you're stitching together stories and books two, three, four, five at a time. So uh, to all the young aspiring authors who are watching, how do you stitch together the, the characters? Is it already pre-decided? Do you have a particular style of, of penning down things? That's some small secret that you can let out to write a successful best-selling novel? No, I think quite simply, 
storytelling, not writing. Anyone who has a good education and is well read can be a writer. Storytelling is a God given gift. And I'm very privileged and very lucky because the stories come every single day. I was writing this morning between six and eight when a completely new idea came. So that's a piece of luck, that particular gift. And uh, I'm afraid the truth is that there are a lot of good writers. Storytellers are more rare. In your own country, for example, you've had Nobel Prize winners and you've had very great writers. But R.K. Narayan can tell a story better than any of them. Magaldi Days is a brilliant piece of storytelling. He just happens to be a very good writer at the same time. So, but your stories have a mix of everything that excites the reader, whether it be romance, crime, a thrilling chase with a climax and an anti-climax. It's almost like Hollywood and Bollywood movies that's, that, that come to life when you read your novels. Uh, as Detective Sergeant William Warwick, um, he solves a case that is hidden in plain sight. If you can let us know a little more about what he's going to be doing in the third book, a small snippet into what he's exactly going to be doing in the third book. Is it, is it all the genres, are they again going to be involved in, uh, in the third book? Or is there any one particular genre that you focus on if you can't give too many details? In the latest book, the commander calls him in, his boss, and says, we've got a massive problem because we're finding there are some people, not many, some people in the Metropolitan Police who are taking advantage of the system. They're making money by doing different crimes, which they know they can get away with. And William Warwick is given the job of catching one in particular who's been trading drugs and dealing with large sums of money. And he puts one of his young officers, a young lady, a young girl, into his area. And the problem is she falls in love with him. So William now has a double problem of whether to believe her or not. So I'm always looking for an angle that's different. I'm always looking for a way, as you kindly say, of demanding the page is turned. But I go back to saying that's that's the gift i'm not a ballet dancer i'm not a tenor i don't open the batting for england <laughs> i tell stories it's a gift right so but this gift of storytelling much like much like uh, cricket. You know, some cricketers are just natural gifted cricketers. There's some storytellers are naturally oh, gifted. When I look at, well, Coley, of course, who's dominating the world at the moment, uh, gave his wicket away. Uh, gave his wicket away. He looked set for 100 today. But when you look at, I mean, I, if I could choose, I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm a friend, luckily, a considerate of Tendulkar and Gavaskar and Raoul Rabbit. But if I've asked which of those three I'd like to be, it would be Raoul Rabbit, because he's so beautiful as a batsman. It's, he makes it look so easy. Whereas if the team needed 50 to win, and I depended on one man to get it, it would be Gavaskar. He'd take his time over it, but he'd, he'd win the match for us. <laughs> but arguably the greatest cricketer I've seen in my lifetime is Sachin Tendulkar. And very diplomatically answered. You took the three, probably three finest batsmen in India and you... Well, <laughs> just wait patiently, child. I will tell you that I was saying five years ago that Pajura was very special indeed. And I got lots of letters from Indians when I said I thought he was the new Raoul Dravid. They said, no, he isn't. He's the new VVS Laxman. Yes. And when I look at Pajura, I saw it five years. I couldn't understand why you dropped him. It was beyond me. Yes. He is a class act. And he saved you a bit today. Very 
he, he did, and his dismissal is, uh, is something that's... A web. I, I mean, off the shoulder of one man into the arms of another. That is a bad luck. You, if, you, if you wrote that in a book, everybody would laugh. You know, that's, that's very true. But like you said, you know, there are certain batsmen who are gifted. There are certain storytellers who are gifted. Now, uh, what about the hardworking kind? It's like you mentioned Rahul Dravid. He's not ne necessarily as gifted as a Sachin Tendulkar is or, you know, um, you know as, as much as a Viranda Sehwag is. But he's yet, you know, your favorite and my personal favorite as well. So for writers who aspire to be the next Jeffrey Archer, who are 15 and 16 and 17 who are watching this, is there a way to learn the art of storytelling? Is there well, a I'm bound to say that I was up at six o'clock this morning, yes. writing for two hours. My daily routine is six to eight for two hours, a two hour break, 10 to 12 for two hours, a two hour break, two to four for two hours, a two hour break, six to eight for two hours. I go to bed by 9, 30, 10. I get up at 5, 30 the next morning. I will do the first draft in 300 hours, about 50 days. And the book you have in front of you, Rajiv, my latest, right. 14 drafts before you were allowed to see it. Wow. So I suspect that I am more of a Raoul Dravid <laughs> than I am of a Sachin Tendulkar. If so I'm Sachin the... Tendulkar's wife has read all my books. And, and I think she's not the only Indian to say that I've read all of Jeffrey Archer's books. Um, and, and there are, like I said, the 600 million young people who are in India, many, like I said, tens of thousands who are watching this live right now, and I'm sure millions will watch it later. Um, it's, it's you who keep us gripped to, that, uh, to the book and to the smell and the scent of the book. Because quite honestly, if somebody were to ask uh, young people saying you're used to reading books digitally, I'd, I'd say that, you know, if there was a Jeffrey Archer book, I would yet go and pick up the book and then read the book per se uh, in my hand and hopefully get an autograph. But here we're getting an in interview and a conversation. So it's very kind of you to take out time and do this. But let me take you to your other part of your life, which is not necessarily as an author, but which has contributed to your writing, I think, to a very large extent. When Saddam Hussein um, was ruling at that juncture for the Kurds, you did so much. I think as, as early as your 20s, in your early 20s, you started fundraising. And that's something that you passionately carried out right through your life. But there have been many stumbling blocks sir, from at least what we read in the press and what we hear in conversation. There have been a lot of stumbling blocks. But you've picked yourself up every time. You've always picked yourself and bettered yourself. Now, when the pandemic struck for young people across not just India, but the world, it was a catch-22. It was a difficult situation. We were up against the wall. Now, uh, and not all of us were Rahul Dravid. So how do, you, how do you deal with situations which are tough situations and yet come up triumphant? Because that's quite honestly your life. It's a very good question and a very fair question. Uh, the truth is that uh, you have to have tremendous energy and belief in yourself to get up when you've been knocked down. I've loved my charity work. I've spent, uh, I've raised just over a hundred million pounds in my lifetime for different charities. 62 million of it uh, doing auctions. I love doing auctions, many for Indian charities, which I've enjoyed in London. Many I've done for Indian charities uh, in, in uh, London. The, the Nawab of Patodi's daughter invited me to do a an auction in uh, London, which I much enjoyed. So the fundraising side has been fun. Now you've raised an absolutely bigger point, Rajiv, absolutely, Rishabh, you've raised a much bigger point that children in lockdown right. have had their lives messed about. And when they come out, I'm very, very worried that they will have lost many opportunities to mix with their friends and being educated head on, face to face. And so the sooner we get out of this evil thing, the better, because the biggest sufferers are not me sitting in my home writing. I'm not a sufferer, I've had my jabs. The sufferer is the 15 year old, the 16 year old, the 17 year old, who's being deprived of teaching, being deprived of great teachers, 
passing on their knowledge. So I pray that this will be over very soon. So you pray that this will be over very soon and so do we. And I think uh, India is trying its level best in order to vaccinate the world. But, uh, <laughs> but at, the, at the same point in time, sir, you've been hit with many adversity. Now, um, of course, all the viewers who are watching have, have closely observed your life. And like I didn't mention, you know, after raising so much money for the Kurds when, when the whole Saddam Hussein regime was going on. Um, and, you know, when you... So it's been numerous occasions in life when you've been facing adversity. When after doing something successfully, people have come back and criticized you. Now, it's not easy to take criticism. Of course, today, um, those 320 million readers of yours absolutely love and adore you. But I'm sure there was a time when you faced criticism for the first time. And then uh, I'm sure, were, were there moments that it was difficult to take? And how did you deal with it? Because I think that'll be a learning lesson for all young people watching, including me. Well, I must say, Rishabh, you're in a much worse position than I am. And the young people are in worse position than I am because I never had, when I was a young politician, Twitter. I never had Facebook. Right. I never had any of these things where thousands of people can give their opinion. And sometimes, very cruelly, I read about young people committing suicide because they can't handle what you, de what you describe. They can't handle the pressure. And that's terrible. That's evil. So uh, now, uh, I never went through those things. I think young people going into politics today, uh, I've never had it so bad from that point of view. They say something and they're criticized by everybody the next day and criticized by people not willing to give service themselves, who, great, who are very good at criticizing but not very good at actually getting up and doing something. So I'd say to young people listening to this, go for what you want for. Go for it and don't be frightened of these idiots who criticize you, these idiots who haven't anything better to do. India at the moment has some of the most exciting young people in the world. When I speak in schools in India, I am come away marveled by how good, particularly the girls, which are, <laughs> they are bright as buttons, the next generation in India, and they're going to tear you lot apart, <laughs> and I will be there to support them. You know, and we're, we're, we're in fact blessed to have such young, phenomenal women who are leaders across walks of life, and you know, 25-year-old pilots who, um, a young girl who's a Kashmiri pilot, who just flew in Bangalore a few days ago is another stark example of somebody who's faced a lot of adversity but has come out triumphant. And you know, 25 is doing better things than I am. So, but, but the idea is that there's so many of these young people across the country and as long as we have people such very as- Very exciting. It's very exciting. You have a, an exciting generation coming in India, which in my view, it's already happening in England, will right. dominate. We have, a two Indians and a Pakistani in the present English cabinet. You know, I think I will live to see an Englishman in the present English cabinet. <laughs> oh. But sir, you've, you've had a very distinguished career also in the field of politics. You've actually, um, you know, not just when it comes to London, but representing the United Kingdom as well. And uh, is, there, is there a second inning in, in that that is coming up? I'm 80. Uh, I'm very, very proud of one of the young Kurds I had on my Kurdish campaign called Nadim Zahawi is now the minister for vaccines. And he is the triumph behind or one of the triumphs behind. He's the leader of those people who've made a tremendous success because we're now up to 15% of our people have been uh, jabbed and he, we're up to 12 million have been jabbed. So it's a triumph for him. So no, I get a great deal of pride in seeing the people who were young and in my campaigns, four of them in the cabinet. Well, and as I say, the minister of vaccines. So it, my pleasure now is helping young people and helping them to achieve things and not be frightened of what you rightly called Richard, what you rightly called those people who spend their life criticizing. 
No, absolutely. And also we live in a climate which is very polarizing, sir. And if I may, I, if I may take that second in order to ask you, it's a very uh, polarized climate both across the world and also uh, in large parts of the country where either you are right or either you are left. Uh, but but you can hardly be center of right or center of left that's or right. center for that matter. That's, but, pathetic. And, that's pathetic. When I entered the House of Commons as a young man, I was 29 years old. Right. You could chat to the late, I was a conservative, you could chat to the Labour Party. In fact, the Labour Prime Minister, Harold Wilson, right. I consider to have been a friend. I used to take advice from him. I used to listen to him. I liked his company. Oh, I hate this. Oh, you're on the right. I'm on the left. I'm right. You're wrong. No, no, no. I hate it. I hate it. I think you should listen to other people. It's just possible they're cleverer than you are. And it's just possible they're right when you're wrong. Oh, no, I don't like this, this present attitude of uh, I'm right, you're wrong. Uh, I like the center ground, honorable discussion, Absolutely. and the best coming out that you can possibly do. The best coming out. And that's what, what's shown in your books. The best comes out in the books. Yeah. And let me take you to the, the books again and ask you the final set of questions. What, what's the one word, sir, that comes to your mind when I say the following words? When I say books, what's the first thought that comes to your mind? Thank heavens we have them. <laughs> a joy, a joy. When, when, when I say Detective Sergeant William Warwick. Ambition, honesty, decency. When I say India, sir, what's the first thought that comes to your mind? Um, second class cricketers, first class brains, <laughs> <laughs> and one of the loveliest races on earth. They're gentle, kind people who I've loved all my life. I'm going to be sending this to Sachin Sindulkar. I'm going to be sending it to him and his wife. <laughs> my very best wishes. <laughs> but when I you know, what I like about him, it's interesting you say that. No. What I like about him, no. and what I like about India, and what I like about Indian cricketers, is the way Kumble behaved in Australia, and the way the Indian team behaved in Australia. My God, the Australians have got a lot to learn about good manners when they play India, because you never, never lower your standards at that level, which made, for me, Kumble a great hero. So, and that's 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 good. Um, that's that's great coming in from you. But the Australians will say that's that's all the ashes vendetta that is coming out. But uh, but, but let me. <laughs> but let It'll me... be a good series, I yeah. hope. Actually, Root is proving to be a, a really world-class batsman, and uh, he's up there with uh, Coley, Williamson, and Smith of Australia. Those are the four great batsmen at the moment. Absolutely. But so when I when I say youth, when I say young people, so what's the first thought that comes to your mind? Oh, excitement. I just love their, I love their enthusiasm, their energy, the belief that anything can be done. And we must make sure they don't lose that. They, you lose it in time. I've remained an optimist. I'll never be a cynic. But I love the enthusiasm in the young. They can do anything. I, I was on stage in um, Chennai. Right. And I asked how many people in the audience had written a book and, uh, and, uh, and how many had been published. And there was a 12-year-old girl who had <laughs> one of her children's stories published. So I got her up on stage, 12 years old. I got her up on stage and I said, well, what are you going to do in life? And she said, I'm going to sell more books than you. And uh -huh. I, thought, oh, wonderful. I thought that was wonderful. I adored her for it. Absolutely. Quite right, too. We might beat the English when it comes to the cricket matches, but I don't know about beating the number of copies that you've sold, but I, I like the optimism and that's what India is about. Right. Yeah. And we must never, never dampen that. That's where great teachers have a gift. I spoke in a, a school in Jaipur where the headmistress, I mean, I wanted to go back to school. She was so inspiring. And when I talked to her children, I could see why they were so special. Right. It's because of this teacher, this special teacher who was leading other teachers. And that, I'm afraid, is one of the things that COVID has thrown out of the window. 
Well, but um, conversations such as these keep the spirit high. And let me ask you a fun one. When I say food, sir, what's the first thought that comes to your mind? Well, I'm pathetic because I'm an, I like fish and chips. Uh, I like spaghetti bolognese. Right. And when I'm in India, I have to call for the chef and the manager and say, I can't take it hot. I cannot take it hot. And they laugh at me and they go away and they make me a special meal for a silly Englishman. Uh, for, for an Englishman, I'm sure that they are very happy to have at their hotel. And uh, the last one, let me ask you, is when, when somebody says, turn a blind eye, what's the one, one thought that comes to your mind? Well, of course, it's, uh, as you know, uh, and we're probably hinting for this, it's what Nelson did at the Battle of Copenhagen. He was ordered by his commanding officer to cease the battle, retreat, and come home. And he put up his telescope to his blind eye, because he had one blind eye by then. He had one arm and one blind eye, one of the bravest men Britain has ever produced. And he put up his telescope and he said, I do not see the command. And that is where the expression, turn a blind eye, comes from. It comes from Nelson refusing to obey, obey the order of the commanding officer of the fleet and to going on and winning the battle. And if I may probe and ask you, and therein lies the story of the third book. Sorry? And therein, therein lies the story of yes, the third indeed. book. Is that, is that correct? Yes, you sometimes in life have to turn a blind eye. But, but sir, it's been a pleasure to be able and, and an honor to be able to do this with you. No. Uh, on, on behalf of all the 20 plus thousand young students who work at the organization and the millions who are impacted, and I'm sure the millions who will watch this, uh, it's been a pleasure and very humbling to be able to do with this with a man who honestly I feel is the Sachin Tendulkar when it comes to the gift that he has in terms of storytelling. And with the 14 times of the draft that he goes through is the Rahul Dravid also of storytelling. So when you've got Sachin Tendulkar and Rahul Dravid together, I think then you say that, that is a great compliment because I know and love both men. They're extremely fine men. If you take them out of cricket, they're extremely fine men. And it's been a privilege to uh, know them in my life. No, sir, and, and, and quite honestly, from knowing the two, knowing of the two of them and meeting them a couple of times and seeing you and this conversation that's happened, quite honestly, and reading your books, I can quite honestly say once I heard that 14 times that you've gone through it, plus, of course, the gift that you have. I quite honestly think that that's, that's the befitting compliment to give. But thank you, sir. It's, it's quite an honor and very humbling to be able to do this. And uh, like, I, I just end the conversation thank by saying, I'll just end the conversation by saying that turn, do not turn a blind eye to the book, Turn a Blind Eye, because that quite honestly is going to be another book that is a must read and is going to be a compelling read for sure. It's a bestseller that's waiting to be read by millions in India. And we hope that we can host you very soon in India. Thank you very much indeed. As soon as we get through this dreadful uh, COVID-19, uh, one of the first trips I will make is to your great country. I, it's the first time for 30 years that I haven't been there once a year and I can't wait to get back. And we're eagerly looking forward to hosting you. So on behalf of the country and also on behalf of the organization, thank you very much. Sir thank Jeffrey Archer, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.